something wrong. Uh, so welcome everyone uh, to the second workshop of MCLS uh, on online experimenting uh, with some experience on children as well. So I'm really excited about this workshop uh, because I'm guessing like many of us uh, due to the current pandemic situation we had to adjust a lot of our experiments um, and everybody is trying to find a way how to adapt uh, our methods um, which online is now great although it gives a couple of extra challenges with it as well um, for instance there's lots of different platforms uh, which we don't all know what it's all about so that's great that we have some different people with different experience um, and also if we're thinking about testing in children well this is definitely an extra challenge to doing it online. Um, so we have a great panel here today uh, who will be talking about their experience with us. So we'll start with James Fallon from Carlton. We'll be talking about um, Gorilla and the use of Gorilla. Uh, and then we've got Rachel Gordon um, from uh, Maryland who will be talking about testing children through Zoom. Uh, with or without cats. Um, and then we've got Yunji, who will be talking as well about Gorilla, Qualtrics, uh, Zoom, lots of experience on testing children as well. Uh, so very excited to have them here. Um, I'll let them, the, I'm hoping to get a bit of discussion and to, to offer you lots of opportunities to ask them questions. Um, so we're gonna shortly, they're gonna shortly present what they, their experience with everything. And then after that, we're going to open it up for a Q&A session. So keep your questions ready because um, there's lots of time for that afterwards. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to give the floor to you, James. Perfect. Thank you very much for the introduction, Elsa. And hi, everyone. Thank you uh, so much for being here. So if you just give me a second, I'm going to share my screen. And all right. So uh, again, thank you all for being here. Um, today, I'm just going to talk a little bit about my experience using Gorilla as an online data collection platform. And specifically, I'm going to be focusing on the uh, task editor uh, functionality of Gorilla. So just to give you a brief overview of what I'm going to be talking about today, I'm going to start uh, by talking about my experience with the recruitment process uh, in an online environment. I'm going to talk a little bit about actually using Gorilla itself, including developing experiments using the task editor, analyzing the data, and just a brief pros and cons list of my experience. Uh, I'm then going to talk about some IRB considerations uh, that you might want to consider, as well as some logistical considerations, and then leave you with my uh, closing thoughts. So uh, to start with my recruitment process, I just want to preface this with all of my studies using Gorilla have used participants that are taken from Carleton University's undergraduate student research, uh, research pool. Uh, so these are students who are enrolled in a first or second year psychology course, largely, and uh, complete experiments for a partial course credit towards these courses. And so with that, Carleton University... requirements to participate in your study uh, can sign up for it and after signing up to participate can view the link and actually go and complete your study. And unlike an in-lab study where you might want to book a specific time slot, participants who are completing uh, these online studies can do so at their convenience and at any time. So obviously this is a huge plus uh, for a researcher because uh, if you design these uh, studies without the need for an interaction with participants as I did with my studies, it means you can meet your recruitment targets very quickly. And because they're not in lab and there's no interaction whatsoever, uh, lab and researcher resources weren't really a limiting factor. Re in my case, I found that I could recruit uh, participants really as fast as they were interested in participating in my studies. Um, and with that, because I found the process was so streamlined and because I could collect a really large amount of data rather quickly because of my hands-off approach, I didn't really find any negative impact to recruitment. I found that my recruitment targets for my studies were met faster than they would have been possible uh, in an in-lab set setting 
And uh, overall, I found that I spent much less time actually administering my study because I didn't have to be there to interact. And uh, the credit granting uh, through Sony integration with Gorilla made things very straightforward. So I'm gonna now talk a little bit about uh, actually developing experiments in the platform. Um, so I found that for my purposes, the task editor was going to be uh, the ideal pick because the tasks that uh, my studies were using were relatively straightforward. Uh, and by that, I mean, there weren't really any complex stimuli to display and there were no complex uh, responses. Um, and as I said, that just made them a perfect candidate for using uh, Gorilla's task editor. Uh, I'll now talk a little bit about the uh, different um, sort of sections of the Gorilla Task Editor and my experience using them and how that uh, sort of ties all together in, in developing tasks for Gorilla. So I'm going to start with what I call the front end of the Gorilla Task Editor. Uh, and I call it this simply because it's everything that your participants are going to see and care about. Uh, and this is really the, the front facing element of, uh, of your Gorilla Tasks. Uh, this is formally known as the task structure, and this is made up of elements that are called uh, displays and screens. So a screen uh, on Gorilla is made up of these elements called zones uh, that are either uh, displayed or hidden, but are fixed in place on the screen. Um, and both the screen and, and uh, zones are fully customizable with templates available for the screens in case you want to uh, you know, have a good starting point to develop your tasks quickly. Uh, and it's useful uh, for creating individual components within your trials. Um, so for example, you might have one screen to display a picture, the next to collect a uh, text entry, that sort of thing. And it's very useful to think of these uh, screen elements as sort of individual events uh, within your trial. Uh, next, you have the displays. So these are made up of at least one screen. Uh, and these are going to display the screens in the order that they appear uh, from left to right. And it's useful to think of these as the structure of your individual trials. And just to give you a better idea of, uh, of how it actually looks, on the left, you'll see uh, a bunch of boxes that are with, uh, with gray headings. These are, are your displays. And within that, you see uh, your individual screens uh, arranged from left to right. On the right-hand side, you actually see the screen editor there. And so what you can do is configure this how you need to for your experiment. So you can accept uh, button entries uh, as I have here. And you also can uh, pull uh, elements from your, your spreadsheet, which I'll talk about in a moment. You can refer to elements there uh, as well as validate answers. As you can see at the very bottom with uh, the active response section. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the back end, and I simply call it the back end because it's everything that you are going to care about as the researcher. This is in essence, what's driving uh, the experiment itself. So this is also known as the spreadsheet, and this contains all the information that you're going to need uh, to run your task, including uh, to display the individual displays and screens within that. So this spreadsheet is going to control the order and randomization of your trials and blocks. Uh, it's going to store the correct answers for all of your trials, and it's going to control the presentation of trial-specific information. So for example, any audio files that you might wish to present, text, images, what have you. So you can build this spreadsheet in Gorilla, but I recommend using the spreadsheet software of your choice simply because spreadsheet softwares have all the conveniences and features that would make this much easier to develop in a much uh, shorter span of time than the Gorilla Spreadsheet Editor will. Uh, and it accepts Excel files, CSVs, and ODSs, so you have uh, options here to use the Spreadsheet Editor of your choice in order to um, develop your experiments. So what I find a particularly noteworthy point to make here is that the spreadsheet is read-only and its contents will be included in the output. So this is incredibly useful if you want to do dummy coding in advance uh, to save yourself time later on because all of this information will be included uh, in Gorilla's output. And just to give you a brief visual of what the spreadsheet tab actually looks like, so you can see here, I've got uh, elements controlling uh, the randomization of my blocks and trials, as well as what display I'm displaying at any given time. 
uh, as well as other various columns for elements that are being uh, used by Gorilla. So you'll notice uh, on the left-hand side, largely, you'll see uh, columns that are column headings that are tinted in green. So that means that these elements are actually being referred to uh, somewhere in your task structure. So Gorilla can either re refer to these or use them as a source uh, for display in your experiment. And on the right-hand side, these are elements that are just on the spreadsheet but aren't currently being used by Gorilla, and they're filled in with white. And as I mentioned previously, this is useful for dummy coding your trials, and this will just make your analysis uh, easier after the fact because all of this information in the spreadsheet is being included. And because it's read-only, it's not affecting anything else in the, uh, in the task itself. And finally, I'm just going to uh, briefly mention uh, the experiment structure only because I wanted to show you how easy it is in my experience and just generally to create an experiment structure within Gorilla. So as you can see, it's all object-based and you're essentially connecting different nodes uh, to tasks, randomization options, um, experiment logic in order to control where your participants are going and what sort of tasks and features within those tasks are being um, active at any given time. Uh, with regards to analyzing data itself, um, much like with uploading a spreadsheet, you can download it as an Excel file, CSV, or ODS. So again, you have options to use the software uh, of your choice. Um, but uh, I've noticed that Gorilla includes lines in the output for every single event in your tasks. So every screen that's displayed in a, in a given display, that's going to be included as a line in your output. Um, and many of these aren't actually going to be relevant uh, for your task or for your later data analysis. So with that, you'll probably find it best to clean up your, uh, your output beforehand by removing these extra lines before actually proceeding with your analysis proper. So for less complex tasks, which I found for um, you know, some of the tasks that I developed, it's very easy to just filter out unwanted rows. Um, however, if you have more complex analyses um, where you have multiple stimuli being displayed, multiple, um, multiple events that are of importance, you'll probably find it best to actually go and restructure uh, this output. One option, that uh, that's, that's suggested by Gorilla itself is using pivot tables in Excel. Uh, however, if you prefer using, C using CSV files, you can, uh, I've also heard that Pandas for uh, Python is a recommended option, a, a good alternative. Uh, just to give you a brief uh, pros and cons list of my experience uh, using and developing tasks in Gorilla overall, I first found that uh, it's very straightforward to actually develop these tasks and create an experimental design uh, in Gorilla. And cloning old tasks and adapting them can save you, yourself even more time. So if you find, for example, that you created a task in the past that has the same general structure of what you want to use uh, for a task you're making, it's very easy to just clone it um, and edit a few options to uh, tailor it how you want for this new task. Uh, I also found that in my experience, since I had no participant interaction on my part, it allowed for a very rapid collection of my uh, of data and for you know my recruitment targets to be met in a very short period of time. As I mentioned previously, the real limiting factor was just how interested people were in actually participating. I also found uh, the task editor generally to be very feature rich. Uh, for my purposes, it had everything I needed as well as everything I might expect uh, from an online uh, collection from an online experiment platform such as this, as well as some features that uh, are a, a nice bonus. And finally, purely anecdotally, the data I collected uh, in my tasks were pretty comparable to what I uh, would expect from an in-lab study. Uh, in terms of cons, I don't really have many, uh, but I think uh, the biggest con for me was just that uh, there is a lot of extra data output and that can make uh, actually organizing your data for analysis a bit tedious and potentially a little bit difficult. However, as I mentioned, you could save yourself a little bit of time later on by naming your displays and screens appropriately to help make this easier for you later on. As well, I noticed a few technical limitations with the task editor. Uh, chiefly, if you 
uh, there's actually no way to display multiple stimuli in random order in a given trial. Um, however, I don't know that this is a limitation of the gorilla as a platform necessarily, and it may not be a limitation uh, at all with the code editor. However, I personally can't speak to that. Uh, I'll briefly mention some of the IRB considerations that I had when uh, developing my experiments in Gorilla and uh, carrying out my studies. Uh, I'll just preface this with uh, the fact that the studies I conducted were deemed a minimal risk. So by that, I mean there was no more harm than uh, what participants could be expected to experience in their daily lives, full disclosure, um, no, uh, uh, no uh, at-risk groups, and uh, no deception used. So with that, um, participants were effectively performing the same tasks that, they, that I would have them doing in a lab, only instead now they were at home and uh, using their own devices. Um, so in, in that respect, with regards to uh, any, any additional protocol considerations, there weren't really any simply because the, they were so similar to what I would have them doing in a lab. However, because these studies were online, uh, I did add some items to the IRB applications in consent forms. Um, and particularly, that was just information regarding uh, data storage on Gorilla. So for example, the server locations, the method of hosting, as well as protective measures in place for the data. In essence, how the data was going to be handled by Gorilla, uh, in addition to how the data was going to be handled by myself and the research team. As well, I added some additional eligibility requirements to my studies. Uh, namely, I want participants to have a desktop or laptop computer with internet access. Um, and I included these device requirements specifically because I thought that for my purposes, the data would be best collected on, uh, on a keyboard as opposed to someone using their phone or a tablet. I'll just briefly mention some uh, additional considerations uh, that I consider and that you might wish to consider in, uh, in your own studies. Uh, the first of which is task demands. So in all cases, we want to be mindful of what we're asking our participants to do. Uh, but in an online environment, it might be helpful to keep the task demands reasonable with the intent that you're both minimizing attrition and uh, encouraging completion of the, ta of the uh, study. And I found this to be especially true um, in my case where I didn't have any interaction with participants because it's very easy for participants to just uh, close their browser tab and withdraw from your study and not complete it afterwards. So keeping your task demands reasonable so participants don't think uh, your study is boring and not worth completing is uh, an important consideration. Uh, and finally, I uh, also think it's important to consider device requirements uh, when you're developing your tasks, um, simply because that there could be devices that conceivably could affect the quality of the data that you're collecting, or that you may think impact the quality of the data you're collecting. And uh, with that respect, it might be beneficial for you to restrict your devices. So as I mentioned previously, I restricted my, uh, I restricted participants' device usage to only be uh, computers. A laptop or desktop, but you might find that uh, having participants only complete uh, your phone, uh, complete the task on their phones or tablets is better suited for your purposes. And finally, I'll just leave you with uh, some closing thoughts about my experience with uh, Gorilla. Uh, first and foremost, I just found the task editor was relatively easy to learn and easy to use. There was lots of support documentation to help me with the learning process. And once I uh, became more familiar with it, it got easier and easier to actually use and develop experiments in. Uh, I found that Gorilla's output typically requires some restructuring before analysis, uh, but there's steps that you can take during the task construction that'll make this a lot easier uh, for you to analyze and refine uh, later on. And finally, for my purposes, I found that Gorilla was an excellent alternative to in-lab studies. And in some respects, it was even better. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. And I can now uh, turn it over to Rachel. Thank you, James. I'm going to flawlessly now share my screen, just like I do with all of my Zoom study participants. All right, y'all are seeing that? 
Beautiful. All right. So I am going to assume that you are all here today because you're interested in running an online study. And hopefully some of you are here because you want to run an online study with kids. Um, so I'm going to talk about briefly overviewing that entire process and sort of what that looks like in terms of interacting with the kids and their parents as well. Uh, so I run two different kinds of Zoom studies, so I'll break it down. Uh, the first kind is asynchronous studies. So these are um, the types where parents and kids can do an activity that you've distributed at any time, and then they kind of send you their data, either video or other types, back during a certain time frame. And then the second type are synchronous studies. So this is kind of the standard version that you see where a kid is working with an experimenter at a scheduled time via Zoom. So there is some overlap between the two. Um, in particular, before the study, the recruitment and consent is pretty similar. And then after the studies, the data storage and payment is uh, the same as well. Uh, so just to structure this talk, I'll go through the things that are the same for both of these types of studies. Then I'll differentiate between the two for the protocols. And then we'll come back and talk about the similarities between the two after. So to start with recruitment and consent, um, my biggest suggestion is to make one ad, think of this as sort of branding for your studies, um, or make one study per ad. Uh, put as little information as your IRB will allow. You're probably looking at this like, gosh, Rachel, that looks like a lot of text. And I will say we edited it as much as we could without leaving out any critical information that our IRB wanted. Um, and this way we can actually distribute this particular advertisement in any way that we wanted. So this is um, allowed to be shared either virtually, so via email, social media. We can send this out in email blasts directly to parents or schools, um, anywhere we want. So in particular, when you're making these uh, advertisements, you can use Adobe Creative Cloud, Canva, Word, PowerPoint. Um, in particular, you can double check to see if your institution actually offers any free license for the pro versions of these. Definitely don't pay for any software. That is my biggest tip. Um, typically, you'll find out it's like, hey, who knew that I could have all of these Adobe cool features for free if I just log in with my institution email. So once you've made your pretty ad, you can share that across platforms. So here's an example of me tweeting out to uh, the abyss about this particular study. As you can see, I have a direct link to my consent form. Um, that's another big tip. The easier you make it for people to sign up, the easier it will be. Um, so in particular, I've shortened the URL. Again, another branding thing. Um, so that way, rather than it just being like a www random information, it actually says the name of the study, which maps onto the ad. So parents can kind of see this pop up on their Twitter feed. Uh, they can scan the QR code if they're feeling fancy. That will also link to our sign up. Uh, and they have all of the information in the same place, regardless of where they've seen this advertisement. So another great place where you can share your study information is childrenhelpingscience.com. Uh, hopefully you guys have all heard of this. It's an awesome, awesome place for you to share uh, studies from all a bunch of different domains. Um, so in particular, you can share information about like the who, what, and how uh, for your study, your participants, all of that great um, information. And parents can actually sign up here. It won't link directly to your study if it, or your study sign up rather, if that's on Qualtrics. So you can link it to maybe your website um, or it will just send you an email and you can respond back with your pretty advertisement or directly to your sign up form. But once you've advertised and hopefully have everything going to one place um, for your study sign up and consent form, um, that way parents can automatically uh, right off the bat consent for your study. So I actually use Qualtrics for all of my studies. Every study gets its own Qualtrics consent form. Um, early on, I was asking for some parent feedback, just sort of anecdotally, you know, how's the, the process going? How did you like the Qualtrics feedback? Uh, to which one parent responded, it could be worse. So take that with, you know, however you will. Um, Qualtrics definitely has some pros and cons for those of you who do survey research, you probably know that. Um, but in particular, you can create uh, 
your consent forms that show up nicely on your computer, on your phone, they look pretty similar. You can add all sorts of information about your lab. You can collect information about the child. And the nice thing is that if your institution already has a Qualtrics account, the data itself is already secure based on whatever sort of internal policies they have. Um, so every study, like I said, has its own form, and so it automatically is generating your sort of um, participant spreadsheets for you, which is nice. One thing I should mention is that I don't currently have any sort of human verification on these forms, which is pretty standard for survey data collection. The reason for that is I am just human verification for my studies. I am always going to be speaking face to face with my participants or at least receiving a video of them directly. Um, so that's something to keep in mind, either adding like a CAPTCHA or something else um, just to verify that whoever your participant is, they're real, um, which is a little bit more in James's camp than mine. Um, one other thing to note I'm happy to answer questions about is that I also have another um, round of Qualtrics surveys at the end. Uh, so I use this for my optional demographic survey as well for parents. So this is really where the two forms of studies start to differ for me. So I will start with the synchronous forms of, uh, of my Zoom studies. So for after the parents have signed up on Qualtrics, the Qualtrics actually nicely will directly send them to another link after the little thank you message pops up. So for synchronous studies, those are the live studies, the parents have to pick a time uh, for their kid to participate. So I use Calendly. The nice thing about Calendly is that you, the researcher, can set up all of the available times that you and your research team um, want to actually run the study rather than it just, you know, say, I'm available at all times of the day. And then they schedule for, you know, 7 p.m. on a Friday when you might want to not be running studies. Um, so this is awesome if, you know, you work at certain hours and then maybe one of your research assistants, you know, can add on to those hours and they're all always flexible and it's really great. Another awesome thing about Calendly is that the parent will actually see all of those available times in their time zone without you having to adjust anything. And then when you get an email saying, hey, you know, a parent signed up, you'll get the information both about the time zone that they're in as well as the time zone that you yourself are in. And so that way you can send a confirmation email that says, this is both of the time zones. <laughs> and everybody is on the same page. And that way it's not confusing for the parent saying, okay, I have to do the math or you have to do the math. We're all math researchers and some of us are bad at time. We know this. Uh, so with that said, uh, before you send a confirmation email, you probably want to schedule the Zoom call in advance. I won't go super into depth about Zoom. Um, obviously, you all made it to the Zoom call today. Uh, but each university has its own host of features. I will say if you're having um, any specific Zoom issues. Um, your university is probably the first place to reach out to, but if you need a Zoom friend, email me directly. I have fought with Zoom a lot over the past year. I'm happy to try to troubleshoot with you. Um, in general, my advice though is to always pre-schedule your Zoom calls, and in general you want to make sure that you're using a specific meeting ID for every participant, not your personal meeting ID over and over. I can talk why. I can talk more about why later if you're interested in that. Another general tip, uh, just to make your life easier, is that these will actually always be switched. Um, so for example, the auto settings are typically that your participants' video is off and that they're muted. So just make their life easier, switch that around, have their cameras already be on and their mute be off, and that way they're ready to go as soon as they log on, unless they change their settings, and then you'll have to troubleshoot for them. One additional nice thing is that you can have these videos set up to automatically record if you'd like to have a recording at the end of the session. Um, in particular, I have all of mine record directly to the cloud. The reason for this um, in particular is that it will give you multiple video views. So if you are screen sharing, um, rather than recording locally where it will just give you one sort of video where the biggest part of the screen is your screen share. Um, when you record in the cloud, it has multiple different versions. So you can select, oh, I just want the screen of my participant. That will make your life easier if you're doing behavioral coding. For example, I code kids gestures. So I don't wanna be staring at a little box trying to see what they're counting on their fingers. Um, 
Zoom also does video transcriptions or rather audio transcriptions. So if you want to start with that as a basis for your transcription, if you use Clan or DataView or anything else like that, it's a great place to start. So once you hit save here, um, oh, actually one more thing, you can add in your research staff as hosts to these meetings so you yourself don't have to run the study. So I can add in my research assistant and they can show up, host the call. I do not have to be there or available. I usually am available just in case they're like, hey, the parent isn't showing up, just like I would be if the study was happening in lab. Um, but either, either way, that definitely makes it easier. Once the Zoom call is scheduled, I have a Zoom in. with that. I integrate that into a Google template uh, for Gmail. The nice thing about these templates is that you can just click on them and it auto pops, auto populates an email for you where you just fill in the blanks. Um, it will always then have my Zoom instructions for every parent. That way I can just assume that no parent knows how to work Zoom um, and they always have those directions there every single time and I just paste their Zoom link and the password to join the Zoom call and everything is always in that same message. This sort of standardizes it. So you're probably wondering at this point, well this is great Rachel, but what about what I'm actually studying? So that comes next. <laughs> so what are you actually studying? You have to choose your research questions and your protocols and then you have to adapt them. So that kind of has to do with the platform that you're using and you know maybe you're going to use Gorilla or you're going to kind of bring that into the Zoom call. Um, maybe that's the part that you're really struggling with. So I'll talk about briefly what we did. Um, in particular, when you are adapting protocols, my biggest piece of advice is to get creative. Um, so think about the things that you've already been doing in your labs in particular, maybe things that don't have a lot of materials uh, and start to, you know, play with those and maybe pilot with other researchers first, right? So piloting with kids is really awesome when you want to make sure it works. Um, but rather than waiting till you've written everything up and you submit for your reviews and then you find out that there's some critical issues with how you've adapted a protocol, start by running these by, you know, some of your friends at MCLS saying, you know, I adapted this. Did I leave out any critical components before I start running some kids? Uh, so let me show you what we did. We actually adapted uh, Geary and colleagues addition strategy um, protocol. So if you're unfamiliar with addition strategy, essentially the very, very broken down version of this is that this involved um, 14 different addition problems on like five by eight index cards that kids got to see and they could solve them however they wanted. Uh, they just couldn't use paper and pencil. And for the experimenter side, the experimenter just had to watch the kid as they solved these problems and they had to look for, um, listen for whatever the kid's strategy was, but also look for any like hand gestures that they might be using, like counting on their fingers. So we thought, okay, well, we could just hold up index cards, but we could also make it a little bit more fun and engaging for kids as this is going to be on a Zoom call. So here's what we did. As kids participated, um, we sort of reframed the context, but kept the essential part of the task the same. So kids would pop onto their Zoom call, we would get them all set up. So we'd ask them to sit all the way back in their chairs so we could see from their head all the way to their belly button. Yes, this is the instructions that we give kids. Um, and that way we could see if they were gonna use any gestures, they would be included in the frame. So here the instructions we give is that, oh, you're gonna answer some math problems, do it as quickly as you can, don't use paper and pencil, all of those fun instructions. And as you're doing that, you're actually working to find some treasure for us. So kids' first problem would pop up on a screen share, uh, just like we're doing right now. Yes, it is a PowerPoint. So the experimenter would ask, what's two plus two? Uh, the kid would respond. The experimenter would say, all right, how did you get that answer? And the kid would say, I counted on from two. All of this is already being recorded. And so there's no actual real need for live coding, which is actually a bonus of Zoom because we can go back and code it later. So that means that as you're facilitating the online study, what you can do is spend your time instead of live coding, really making sure that the kid is attentive, staying in the screen, all of those things that you're wondering beforehand, well, how am I gonna do that and also do everything else I need to juggle? It balances it out a little, a little bit so you can take a breath. 
So as the kid goes, we also have added in additional sort of, not necessarily manipulation checks, but just making sure that the kid is seeing what we want them to see. Uh, so we have added in pieces of the treasure map. So here we say, okay, so here's your first piece of the tre treasure map. Can you see that? And the kid says, yes. You can ask, you know, what are you seeing on your screen? Adding in little bits as the kid goes that's sort of external to the protocol. It doesn't really detract from it, but keeps their attention. So kids will see the problems. It adds to the treasure map. They go through the 14 uh, addition problems all the way to the end, and then they, they did a great job. So in essence, the task is the same, right? You can ask all of the same problems. It's not necessarily exactly a five by eight index card, but we maintained the essence of the protocol. Um, the kids are still seeing the same things. They're getting the exact same script um, with a little addition of some treasure maps. And I uh, drew that on my iPad. That is a treasure map that I drew. So, you know, get creative, draw, drag your kids into it, make them draw things. Um, it really doesn't have to be as intense as I think initially we all thought it did. Um, it just has to be engaging for kids. And this is five to eight year olds. So they love it. They're like, they're snakes. And I'm like, yeah, they're snakes, guys. It's amazing, right? Um, so that brings us back to the two different kinds of studies. So that is sort of the data collection for the synchronous side. And now I will talk about the asynchronous studies. So in particular for the asynchronous studies, if we rewind for a second and think about a parent that has just consented on Qualtrics um, and they've just said, you know, yes, I want to sign up, what comes next? So we'll go back to our email templates there. Uh, so again, I use the same sorts of uh, easy insert template function. The nice thing about this is that if you are using any sort of experimental manipulation on Zoom, um, th this really helps you track that information. So what I mean by that is that you can actually label in here, um, you know, this email template has all of the experimental manipulation for number one versus number two. Um, initially, I think I had this labeled as experimental and then control, and we all know that that's probably not a great idea. So learn from my mistakes, just in case you send it without taking it out. Um, so here we go. Uh, this is what number one looks like. Uh, and yes, you can delete that in the title before sending it. But again, just in case you send it too quickly, a tip, don't label it that. Um, so you can edit that and then you can go through. Uh, but mainly all of these links are already set up for you. In particular, the video that the children are going to watch with their parents before they complete the task is already linked to you know, what they need to see for them to be in the correct experimental paradigm. Um, so this makes things easy. You don't have to type it every time. All you have to do is insert this and make sure that it's correct, send it off. So it really speeds up the process for you. So then in terms of the video and data collection for asynchronous studies, I still use Zoom and I recommend that parents use Zoom. Um, but I do say in that email template that if they're more familiar with using something else, that they're more than welcome to do so and that I am happy to troubleshoot that for them in the case that that is their preference. So in general, once the parent receives the email that I just showed you in the email template, this is sort of how the process works, and I'm happy to talk about this more. Essentially, that email will also contain all of their instructions and the actual PDF of my materials. There's also an option that parents can receive a packet of these materials by mail. Um, but either way, they have the materials, they're ready to go, and they have a two-week time frame to participate, which just means record yourself working through this packet. So whenever they're ready, they can start to record their video, do their interaction, and then once they're all done, they'll have their video file, which they can just send back to me based on the link that was already in that same email. So it drastically reduces where everything is, right? They had one email from me, it had the materials, it had all the instructions, and it has the link that they're just gonna upload that same video file back. Um, so there may be that little extra piece if they're waiting for the mail to come in, which will have their actual packet. Um, but I wanted to offer that as an option to parents just because not everybody has a printer. Um, so that just really opened up to families um, who either just didn't want to print the materials, but also didn't have access to that. 
So that brings us back to what is similar again between the two studies, which, what, which is what happens with those videos after I have them. So either after the live Zoom call or after parents have uploaded that video for me. So in particular, for the data storage and payment. So your data storage depends a lot on IRB and your type of data. So as I've mentioned, my type of data is almost always video data, and these videos are almost always coming from Zoom. And it's also based on personal preference, and we can talk about that as well. So in particular, I use Box and Google Drive as my two main uh, storage places. So Box always has my video data because that's what is uh, the approved forum. And it also allows uh, this linked feature that you can just send out this this is exactly what it looks like. It essentially is just a one page that says, you know, thank you for participating in our study. Please enter your email address and upload your file here. There is no logon. There is no verification. There is no nothing. It is just beautiful and it automatically will link the participant's file directly to your secure box folder within your university's cloud, box cloud. I don't actually know the technical term. I think it's box cloud. Um, but either way, this is a, a really excellent feature uh, that I didn't actually know exist until I played around with it a little bit. I do believe that Google Drive also offers this. So if that is what your IRB approves, you can probably finagle something similar. So the less sign-ons and authorizations that a parent has to jump through, the easier you can make it for them, which is excellent. So with that said, uh, the one place that you should absolutely not be storing any of your data is on your computer itself. I hope this goes without saying, though I do understand that right now it is very easy for you to say, well, I'm running a bunch of Zoom participants and maybe I'm recording the videos and does it really matter if it sits on my computer overnight? Um, it's a really bad habit that's easy to get into, but it is so hard to break. So take it from me. Don't let yourself get in that habit. It's another great reason to just have all of your Zoom videos go straight to the cloud. Let them hang in the cloud, then bring them to Box. Don't let them sit on your computer ever. So let's talk about participant payment a little bit. So there's a couple different ways that you can, rather maybe this should say, you know, compensation or after the study, uh, but certificates, Amazon gift cards or other types of gift cards, whatever way you're thanking the participant for participating in your study, is super important, right? So now they've had a good time in your part, in your study and you want to recognize that. So really what that means is that you want to drive home to the participant that you value your their time and you would love for them to participate in other studies because Lord knows you probably have other data that you need to collect. Um, so really what that means is that you can get creative here. So if you have a database, right? send birthday cards or unique thank yous. Uh, you can also use this opportunity to send sort of word of mouth recruitment. So as you're sending your thank you emails, you can kind of loop in, uh, you know, I have another study for kids in this age. I would love for you to participate. Here's a little bit of information. You can also add the, the beautiful advertisements that you've crafted, um, link those directly in the emails, anything like that. With that said, uh, I have had kids directly ask me whether or not they can participate in these studies the next day. So keep in mind, you're working with kids, like it's not face-to-face. -face. Uh, many of us who work in schools or in labs miss this face-to-face -face interaction, but it feels the same to some of these kids and they really do enjoy these studies, even if we're like, well, they really just like my PowerPoint that has some addition problems. I don't know if they're gonna like it. They do, they really do. Uh, so with that said, uh, I think that's my, oh, nope, tips and tricks, really quick. As I like to say, do as I say, not as I do. Learn from my mistakes. Asynchronous studies, ask parents' preference, whether it's mail or printers, uh, whether it's their communication preferences, set your schedules, stick to them, be aware of parents' boundaries, and respect them. And for your synchronous studies, try to have a plain background, test your Wi-Fi, Set up in advance and go with the flow. They're kids, they're gonna have a good time. And if your cat jumps on your keyboard like mine does 
every other study that I run, the kids are going to love it. And they're not really going to be that distracted. They're just going to be like, oh my gosh, Rachel, a cat. You'll be like, yeah, let's get back to the math. Excellent. So now with that said, if you have any questions or clarifications, um, hopefully I didn't go too over time, please feel free to reach out to me, send me an email. Uh, and with that, I'll pass it over to Yunji. Sorry, I think I took too much time. <laughs> It's, you're fine, Rachel. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, can you uh, can you see my screen? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, great. So. Uh, my name is Yanji Park, uh, and I'm going to share my experience in doing our exper online experimental with kids. And um, my experience is a little bit of mix of James and Rachel's, um, so and plus etc. Oops. Okay. Uh, I hope I can. Okay. So uh, uh, first I will talk about my kids experiment protocol. So it's just an example. So some of them can be bad ones. So just want me to let you know all like the fact that there is a this kind of style. So we do um, three sessions uh, for each kid. Uh, it's kind of long and, um, and I share how that goes. And uh, my experiment is with um, 10 to 12 years old, a little older than what you, Rachel um, is experimenting. So first um, uh, we recruited the participants via email blast to the university people. So staff, faculty and students who have kids. And um, I just chose this way because I'm on my fifth year, so I had no time. So I just chose the way, like uh, the way that I can um, get a kid as, as many as possible, like as soon as possible. So, um, and then email conversation happens. So after email blast and uh, pair, some of parents um, uh, express their interest to us and then uh, we, and then after that, we um, introduce our ex experiment a little bit uh, on email and we send out two links. So one is um, to schedule session one and it's a candidly, uh, calendly links and also quarterings, uh, quarterly links so that we can get a consent form and the demographic information from parents. So um, in this case, um, I use a little different way uh, with uh, what Rachel explained. So when we, uh, when parents set up the schedule, they chose the time that they want. And then like Calendly can be linked to a certain um, calendar and uh, a, a certain Joom account. So uh, there is a way that if we just use a lab account, then it can directly update the calendar and send the links to uh, us and the parents um, simultaneously. So um, in that case, you don't have to like set up the each links for each uh, parents and for each session. Um, that's uh, like one way to use the Calendly. And then session one happens on gym. It's like 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, session one is um, needed uh, because we wanted to make sure a couple of things uh, before we get into real experiments. So uh, first we get a SN form from kids because kids are old enough to get a like signed SN form. So we send, uh, we put a link, uh, the quarter links there so that they can sign up their um, uh, interest. And the, and the next thing is we check out the availability of Google Chrome on their laptop because we use a JS site, which is um, JavaScript library uh, for computerized tasks. So I don't know why, but the JavaScript runs well in Google Chrome, it's really compatible in it. So we empathize and check out whether they have it on their laptop or not. And then we introduce a Zoom functions, whether kids can share a screen and cancel the uh, screen share 
and how to use on chat box and whether they can copy and copy the links and put onto the uh, Google Chrome and share the screen with us. So we just introduce a bit and then we just check like whether they know or not. But fifth grader and sixth grader um, mostly yeah, familiar with the gym. So uh, it was nice to us. And next uh, we schedule session two and three um, in person. So we send out, uh, we put the Calendly link for session two and session three so that they can schedule um, during the time. So in the email, we mention like, please um, uh, take, uh, please uh, see, uh, check out your schedule before we do the session one so that we can schedule right away. And um, so I had, uh, it said like we have uh, three sessions. So session two and session three happen uh, afterwards. Uh, for session two, uh, it takes 40 to 50 minutes. Uh, sometimes one hour because uh, the last task is kind of hard. But we uh, for this session, we do DigiSpend task. Uh, it's a subtask from Wexler. Uh, we say some numbers and they say that uh, right after us, then sometimes forward, sometimes backward. So this is a standard, uh, one standardized task uh, we can do over Zoom. So, um, and then we do like for computerized tasks via Gorilla. So we put uh, the link for each um, task uh, on chat box and they can uh, open that in Google Chrome and share the screen with us. And uh, we on you know, session three, we do, um, it takes like 40 to 50, uh, 45 minutes. We do number transcoding test um, and the math vocabulary test via job form. So number transcoding test, uh, we actually wanted to use the online formats, but it didn't turn out well. It takes time to write a, uh, write a number with mouse. So um, we just do a pencil and paper test. Um, I don't know if it will turn out well, but um, it's going so, and after child, uh, after we read the number and a uh, child write down all the numbers they um, and in the paper, and then they put the papers to the screen and we take a screenshot of the answers and then we score up. And next, uh, I will go into a little bit of details uh, on about Gorilla and job work. So uh, about the platforms coding that we use, uh, James gave a really nice uh, introductions of Gorilla, but we use um, a bit different way to design the task. So I just wanted to let you know that there is another route to um, use a Gorilla as a platform. So uh, my lab first coded up the, all the computerized tasks by using JS Psych uh, is a JavaScript library. It has a lot of function that we need to code um, the psychology, like um, such as a magnet comparison task, like computerized task. So it's like a psych toolbox um, in MATLAB. So it can develop a task script, uh, which is good uh, with any code editor, uh, such as Visual Studio uh, on your laptop. So you can try out whether the code works well or not on your computer and Google Chrome. And after coding up the scripts, uh, we searched uh, different platforms that we can run this code smoothly. We tried Pavlovia, but it didn't turn out well. Like uh, it seems like Pavlovia um, uh, runs well with the simple code, uh, like such as animation task or not. But uh, we have a lot of randomizations and a lot of task stimuli, so it didn't turn out well. And we also tried cognitions. Um, it was a free tool uh, that we can use a JS Psych script, but uh, the JavaScript, but um, it also didn't turn out well because it was free. Uh, the server can a uh, server can couldn't handle all the participants um, doing the experiments simultaneously. So after a um, few tryouts, uh, we found Gorilla. And uh, it was really good. Uh, we have to pay um, some of money, but um, it runs really well and smooth and stable. So, but uh, when you use um, a JavaScript um, code, then you need to tweak the code a bit by uh, using Gorilla's functions so they can be compatible with a uh, Gorilla platform. So um, this is an example of our task. Uh, it's a fraction comparison task. 
And then uh, in Gorilla, it's um, like code editor GUI um, and builder. So um, it's a little different from what James introduced, but uh, we can just copy and paste our code here. And then we can put, um, because this is a fraction comparison task, we just write out the word, uh, write out the numbers, the fractions, and then it the codes um, make the uh, the fractions um, and then also like randomize all the triers, but it also needs some uh, image slides because instruction is on a, as presented as an image. So we put um, all the image that we need. Uh, if it's a like magnitude comparison task, uh, we put like image here uh, instead of um, all the numbers. So we put all the stimuli here and then um, and it can. Uh, just drag the stimuli and um, yeah, um, and present all the stimuli that I wanted in the, like in the right order. So um, yeah, it's which is really flexible. So the good thing about JS Psych, it's really flexible. You can make any kind of experiments you want, like you used um, the Psych toolbox or uh, the Python and or um, E Prime. So this is another way uh, to use Gorilla and uh, our code will be uploaded um, to the OS app soon. And uh, so the code doing everything. So experimental structure is really simple. I just start and then run the code and then finish. So um, yeah, which is another way to use the Gorilla. And uh, next I will introduce our uh, job form. So, um, I really like this uh, because it can allow participants to answer um, any forms of problems, such as like drawing, uh, like participants can draw the answers or select answer among multiple options and write um, any numbers or um, any number like with mouse, or you can just um, type, the, type the name or uh, using, they, um, they can use like drop down menu or something. So for example, uh, they have a builder um, like Gorilla does, and then they have all the uh, options for um, all, almost all kinds of um, questionnaire styles or forms of questions. So uh, for example, if I drag like multiple selections um, in, on, into the builder and you can type the questions in here you, um, in the widget setting, you can, um, you can specify how many options you'd like to give, and you can uh, you can switch this to other like words or um, any any options you want to give, and then also you can um, set uh, you can make uh, the setting as like you can disable the multiple selections or um, able the multiple selections, um, so which is uh, really flexible. Uh, so um, for job form, we use um, uh, we use job form because to um, use uh, Susan's math vocabulary test. As you might know, um, it's a pencil and paper test, um, having various formats of problems. Sometimes children need to draw a figure and select the answer and write down the answers or type the answer. So. Um, we uh, to conduct this test online. Uh, we found job form. Thank God, like one of our found it. So, for example, um, uh, when it comes to multiple selection problems, um, turns out like this. So um, there is a, a lot of options, and I have uh, children have to put like right answers for um, each part of equations. So uh, and they can like if they click here um, this box and they can see drop-down menu and they select the answers from the drop-down menu. And sometimes they can draw with mouse, um, like draw an obtuse angle, a triangle. This is the one that I draw. And sometimes they can type the words. So type the name of each shape in the box. They can just type the words um, they need. So um, yeah, so it's really uh, flexible to all kinds of um, test um, yeah, test uh, problems and um, any format of test. And so the final form looks like this. 
so they can type their participants ID and the form has its own link so and children solve the problem as they drag the page down and after they finish they can see um, submit button and they can just hit the submit to um, and then it automatically goes to the job form server and uh, sometimes they they email to our um, lab accounts about like with um, someone just submitted the math vocabulary test. And also all the data are sent to job form server, uh, as I said, and we can, it's really good because we can extract the response as a PDF file as they did uh, like, like as they do um, pencil and paper test and, or uh, it can merge each problem's answer and um, extract as a CS file, a CSV file or Excel file. It's like a bit improved version of Quirk Tricks. So um, I think my presentation is um, over here. Uh, yeah, uh, if you have any questions, uh, just let me know or um, send me an email. All right, thank you so much, Yunji, James, and Rachel. Um, that was really amazing. Um, I've learned so much, uh, but I'm sure uh, there are many questions out there. So um, please do pop up or put them in chat. Um, so there is a first question already in the chat. Um, lots of questions coming up. For Yunji from Schultz, uh, I don't know if you wanna ask it yourself. Yeah, sure. I could. Hi, thank you for the presentations. It was fantastic. And my question would be that we are trying to use cognition as well to run JSSEC experiments. Yeah. And you said that it broke down with too many participants uh, uh, simultaneously. And my question would be, how many was too many, and how it was it exactly like broke down? Over like thirty or something. Um, it was not stable, so. Ah, because yeah. we didn't so I don't, experience it. Yeah, before. we don't recommend. <laughs> Because we, we tried it before, but we didn't experience it being really? so unreliable. That's why I was asking. Uh, so we used uh, for um, not a children experiments. We used it for um, adults experience, and we send out the link like simultaneously to a lot of people. So I cannot, um, I could not know like how many exactly, but the server was really not stable with, and we mm -hmm. had a lot of struggles while using that. So that's one of the reasons why we switched to a uh, Gorilla platform. And so it, it, approximately it was like, what, 30, 50, 100? Yeah, 10, like 15, like 30. 15, okay. Yeah, 15, yeah. So um, I don't know, like, because it's free, I don't yeah. know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank you, thank you. We have a next question or a couple of questions from Barocas. I can read them out if you want, but if, if you're there, you can ask them as well. Um, hi. Um, I'm sorry, it's just like typing all my questions <laughs> in an email and, and then um, just shot them all at once. Um, so thank you all for your brilliant presentations. Um, as you may have read already, um, I have one question for each one of you. The first one is for James. Um, how do you account for differences in screen size and resolutions and participants' monitors? Um, because that's one problem that I'm having currently or that I'm anticipating. Um, I'm planning to run an experiment in Pavlovia, so I'm also interested in Yunji's um, experience with it. If you could talk a little bit more about that. Um, yeah, so let's start with that question. <laughs> um, sorry, I think you're okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you for the question. It's a, it's a great question. Um, from, from the working with Gorilla that I've done in the task editor, um, it, uh, it displays, um, the experiment in a fixed region of the screen. Um, on computer monitors, and that's displayed at a fixed size from from as best I can tell. Like it will, it will allocate a certain space of the screen. Even if you have it uh, in a full browser window, it will still uh, display in a fixed central region of the screen. Um, so in in that respect, uh, you should you should have comparable um, 
we should have comparable display um, across computer monitors. I didn't personally evaluate um, how how it works on um, mobile and tablet devices, um, but I would hazard a guess that it probably does something similar insofar as it restricts the screen region somehow. Um, with, re with fixing uh, actual image display sizes, um, stepping back a little bit um, to customizing zones and actual screens on Gorilla, you can allocate um, specific uh, sizes for, for each of those zones. So if you want an image to, to take up a fixed portion of, a, of, the, of the screen in a given display, you, you can configure it that way and have the, the image uh, you know, fill, fill that zone within the individual screen. Uh, regarding text itself, uh, you do have the option to use HTML and, and display in rich text formats, so you can uh, define font sizes and, and colors and stylings that way. Does that okay. answer your question? Thank you. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and could you repeat the questions? <laughs> Sorry, I, I forgot. No problem. Um, so the first question that I have is regarding um, the remuneration. Um, were your um, participants compensated yeah, so, for their uh, participation? Yeah, so every session participants get compensations and um, we, uh, when we send out crypto links, there is um, a little, uh, like there is a problem that they can choose the option they want. So we, um, we, have, uh, we have parents to choose on target like Barnes and Nobles and then like iTunes, like Amazon's so that they can choose on what they want and then we send a gift card to them like for every session. Okay, um, but you also used Gorilla, right? Um, uh, yes. Yeah, and I would be interested in knowing what options it offers um, for uh, remuneration so, uh, or for compensation of participants. So Gorilla, mm -hmm. um, for adults, uh, we can like we can look over the data and then we can share like a day, whether they finished or not. So um, uh, to the finished participants, that we can just send out the uh, gift card. Uh, when it comes to children, because it's in person setting, so because of uh, it's like in, we need an interaction with children to go through like Gorilla platform. So since we share the screen, we can um, instruct uh, give instructions um, in person, like uh, over Zoom. I mean, like. So, um, and like after we finished the sessions and we could know like whether they finish or not. So, so we just um, give um, the gift card like after the sessions. Okay, so you have to manually check the output files and see if they- Yeah, output files, the yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. all right. And I would also be interested in your experience with Pavlovia. You said that if you have a more complex design, um, uh, yes, uh, we didn't figure out uh, why it that work, but um, it didn't work out well with our uh, magnitude comparison task. Uh, like we have to, for the magnitude comparison task because there are a lot of triers. Like we we need like various settings, like prac, like when the prac. Uh, no, I mean like how many practice trier they will give, and then like how many. Um, breaks they uh, we want to give. So there are so many different setting and then I think, and then like randomizations like, uh, so I don't know, like, I don't know why, but Pavlovia didn't work out well with our experiments. So <laughs> yeah, we just kind of gave out. And then like, I saw like a lot of Pavlovia experiments um, were really simple experiments, like most of them. So um, that's one of the reasons yeah. why we switched to that, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, so I don't want to monopolize everybody so much. So my next question is gonna be very, um, a very short one. I would like to know from Rachel, if you had any difficulties arising from the asynchronous testing in comparison with the synchronous testing format? Yeah, so uh, that's definitely a good question. Um, and I'll say yes, uh, but also not any more complicated than you could expect for 
um, if you are used to running studies in your lab and then you take those studies outside your lab. Uh, so kind of what I mean by that is that I was pretty used to running studies both in like a pretty controlled, like the camera was already set up in the perfect angle, right, with the perfect sound and everything was wonderful and the lighting was great. Um, and then maybe two hours later, I was also doing data collection sitting on the floor in a dark corner, right? So you're already uh, yeah. adapting to run the exact same methods somewhere else. Um, so if you already sort of have those creative processes, you just kind of have to think through. Uh, so I read your question and I realized I actually have part of the participant packet that I emailed. Um, I know this is going to display backward, but just to give you an idea, this oh, yeah. is the PDF, right? Uh, so just showing examples of what like a good video setup would be versus a bad video setup. And yes, those are stuffed animals because I don't have enough people living in my one bedroom apartment to have it be human. <laughs> Um, right, but you can show like, oh, see, these ones have all of the materials and both of your faces in view. This one does not, it's the back of your heads. Um, and actually the stuffed animals are uh, from Melissa Kibbe's lab at Boston University. I stole one when I was an RA there. I didn't steal one, I got it as a graduation present. But um, yes, you can always reuse those prizes when you leave labs to use them as your own STEM later on. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's just another thing you have to adapt. Uh, so I don't think it's any more or less scary than adapting um, previously. You just have to get creative and see what works and see what comes back. Okay, thank you. Of course. Great, so we have um, a question in chat from Gladys, which is for Yunji and Rachel. So how do you match your participant ID to your Qualtrics consent form or demographics? That's a good question. Um, so I will say that for me at least, the way that things are going to work is that my Qualtrics consent kind of works as a sign up. And so when I'm downloading them, I can reassign, um, kind of de-identify that PDF from their sign up as I'm re-uploading it to Box or wherever I'm going to store that PDF. Um, sort of like I would put it into a file cabinet, I guess. Um, and then that is automatically assigned as their participant number. So then later on when I have data files, if they're going to um, sign up for another, or they're going to complete the second Qualtrics survey that's gonna have their demographics, I actually can send them that unique identifier number via email that says, you know, at the top of the Qualtrics survey, it will now ask you to enter an ID please put in ID 865. I wish I had that many subjects, you know, participant number seven. Um, and <laughs> that way they can kind of track it as it goes. But that sort of initial sign up actually doesn't have an ID. It's sort of up to me to assign that based off of um, as I'm tracking my participants in my spreadsheet. So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, for me, actually, I use birthday as a code. So, um, like when we match like participants, uh, yeah, we have a list of participants. Like uh, we we put like the the participants number and the birthday of their participants. Uh, we do like uh, we wrote down like every time we got a card trick. So we kind of didn't have a problem because we have a like old number for each participants, and then we. Uh, Per, uh, we make a children to put their own code to the gorilla. Like when we um, start the gorilla, there is um, the box and they have the participant, participant number and the experimenter give the participants uh, number like at the time, every time. So um, that's like, it's really flexible by researchers. Yeah. And then like after I, um, finish the experiments, then I can um, use R, I can merge like their birthday and then like uh, the participants numbers to like, um, and they integrate like Quartrix informations and uh, our experimenter information. So I use like participants ID and the birthday like to enter the gorilla like when they do the uh, experiments. Right, so there's a question from Maria Yesenia, but I'm not sure if it's a 
a real question or just um, more information from, from you, Yunji. All right. <laughs> yes, um, it is about, um, I, I would like to ask about the, the different kind of tasks that, that you develop in the magnitude of comparison task. Maybe to know if it is related with we are working now. Uh, so the magnitude of comparison task that we are doing? Yes, uh, the conditions. Uh, the conditions? Um, it's um, the same uh, as like other um, the dot comparison task. Okay. And then, yeah, and uh, we do like ratio comparison tests, like the ratio made by lines and the symbolic fraction comparison. And then there is a like fraction equation task. So all um, right, I I'm understand. Sure, like it's the task that you want, but um, if you want the task or a stimuli, uh, there is a set of stimuli on OSF that I can share. Oh, it would be really helpful. We're going to work in regular and unregular uh, areas. It's like oh, yeah, comparison. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, we have a blob area uh, that we can uh, we made like before. So um, we can uh, share that uh, if you want. Yeah, I, I could really appreciate that. Thank oh, you. Yeah. <laughs> No problem. Um, we have the next question from Colette Duncan. Hi, everybody. Um, I was just wanting to uh, ask Rachel a question. Um, I'm going to be dealing, uh, doing an experiment observing parents and children act, interacting together. So I suppose that's still synchronous. Uh, so we're going to do live observations. And I was just wondering if you have done that. And do you have any advice? Yeah, absolutely. So the study that we're doing um, as an asynchronous study is actually um, the almost the exact same study that we were doing as a live version that we got through 32 participants and then had to shut down. Um, so it was entirely live uh, that we were doing uh, in like home visits or in like after school programs and stuff like that. Uh, so it absolutely can be done live. Uh, you can do it sort of as a mix of the two protocols that I went over. Uh, in particular, if you want to make sure that it's like automatically uh, uploading to your cloud and yeah. you have the appointment, right? You can take out that whole side, like, oh, you have to figure out how to upload your own video file, right? Like, you know, it's already recording. Yeah, because um, we're being asked to get like verbal consent first, start recording, then start recording the task. And it's about keeping all those bits together and you're not losing any of it. It's, it's going to be hard doing it all. Absolutely. So I think that that really is just a blend of the two methods that I went over, right? So you would just schedule um, sort of as a live study. Uh, the great thing about that is that you can kind of take the piece of you out of it when you need to just by turning off your camera. So it feels a little bit more natural for them, but you can still be there as a reference. Uh, it's still recording all of that nice stuff. You'll have like kind of a transcript afterwards. I don't know if that's something you need. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that way too, if they do sort of like wander out of the frame, you can kind of hop on real quick on your mic and say, oh, I just need you to adjust your camera. Or, you know, if they are like, is it okay if we take a bathroom break? Like you'd be <laughs> like, yep, absolutely, right? Like all of these questions that kind of come up when you are live, um, but it takes you out of that um, that weird context. Like, you know, sometimes I'm- I'm lurking in the background just with it. <laughs> yeah, where you're like, I'm just gonna stare at the wall over here. Uh, like you do when you're <laughs> at a home uh, observation or things like that. Uh, so I do think that it actually adds some benefits and I'm happy to talk about that more as well later on by email. Definitely. Thank you very much, Rachel. Thank you. We have a next question from Lauren or everybody, I think. Hi, um, I was wondering if you all are finding more diversity in your participants. I know that um, in the past, um, I in person studies, we tend to find like a certain type of parent, which is like, you know, the, the, the white stay at home mom is more likely to come. And um, that's always been something that I've really like, we need more diversity in these participants. Are you finding that more um, online, you're able to do more, like if, well, 
I don't know, there's a lot of factors to that, but do you find more diversity in the um, children that you all are able to, to um, study now? That's for all of you all, so. <laughs> I uh, I might be in a unique position, maybe in the opposite direction. Um, I'm gonna say no, but the context is important. So the majority of the research that I had been doing um, before the pandemic, I was working primarily in Head Start schools and programs. Um, so I had really an awesome, diverse sample. I am in, you know, a really metropolitan an area too, right? So University of Maryland is right outside of DC. Uh, so we were thriving in so far as not generating really just the standard acronym of weird samples for our kid recruitment. Uh, I can't say particularly, I haven't actually done any data analysis to directly compare the diversity of our samples in so far as factors like parent income or race or any of these like actual you know, if I was going to make it a quantitative analysis of, of what is happening. Um, but anecdotally, it doesn't necessarily feel like um, I've been able to improve it, though I will say the one thing that maybe has changed in terms of um, just shifted in my participant pool is geographic location. So I've actually been able to open this up to worldwide. Uh, so my participants are, you know, just only based off of whether or not they can be conducted in English right now, because you know that's only the limits based on the languages that I speak. Um, so just last week, I actually had participants. One was in Israel, one was in Sweden, and it's only based off of like what time of day I'm awake. That was that was the limiting factor. Um, so it is a little bit more of a global population, um, but I do tend to think that the insofar as diversity in what needs to be amplified in sort of psychological research, mm -hmm. uh, for me at least, is taking a hit for this research, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I, I just started at University of Maryland, so uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yay, I think we're oh, in like yeah. similar people's work. I work with Richard, so. <laughs> oh, awesome, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Let's chat, send me an email. Yes. <laughs> Uh, in my case, I'd say no, because mm -hmm. uh, we collected samples like from Madison area, like mm -hmm. um, so university people, um, kids. So um, if you want to have like diverse uh, people, like um, then should uh, advertise your um, study like in the big like websites or something, <laughs> yeah, I guess, yeah. I I would say that um, my situation is probably similar. I haven't really noticed um, any uh, any increase in diversity, but I think that's largely due to the fact that I've been using uh, internal recruitment through my uh, through my university's recruitment pool before, and I've been continuing to use that now. So in that respect, the the types of people that would be signing up for it, the you know the first and second year students taking psychology yeah. courses, it's probably going to be fairly consistent in that regard. Mm -hmm. But I would imagine that it might uh, it might benefit the people who are uh, doing distance learning or who maybe find it a little harder to get to campus, just because of where Carleton is located. Um, you know, can uh, public transportation getting there can be kind of a pain. Uh, driving there can be kind of a pain. So I think in that respect, it might encourage people uh, a little more to sign up for for a study like this knowing that they don't ha actually have to make the commute to campus but uh aside, aside from that it, it uh i would say that you know i'm probably still getting the same sort of sample that i would be doing this in lab cool yeah that was it i just always wonder about like when start now that we're doing like a lot of the virtual is um the research that I'm like another project I'm on has been the lack of like we're like reliable internet so like mm -hmm. that's always been so it's like okay we are not the people that we might be able to get more of now we still can't because now it's like oh well they might not have reliable internet so okay that's all thank you thank you really great question thank you so much um I've got a question from Bella for Yunji and James Hi everyone, thank you for taking the time to share your experiences with us. Uh, we had great talks today. 
I had a question for James and Yunji about cleaning gorilla data. So James, you said how it can be a little time consuming. Uh, and so I'm wondering if you could share some tips on how to clean, if you think that we should use a R script or if we think we should uh, plan ahead when coding the experiment uh, and how it's the easier way to clean this data. Sure. So um, I'm, I'm personally a big advocate of planning ahead and sort of strategizing in advance um, how I want to go about analyzing my data. And that's, uh, that was, I guess, my biggest tip um, in my presentation was naming your uh, screens and your displays strategically. Because with Gorilla, each, uh, each screen that gets displayed um, and its corresponding display um, is going to be included as a line in your output. Um, and oftentimes these lines might not be anything useful. Um, I don't know if you saw in my example, but I had included um, two screens in a particular display where I just had interstimulus intervals. Now, those are completely useless for my analysis. They're not going to do anything, but they're still going to be included as lines in my gorilla output. So I've, I've personally found that by naming my, uh, my screen sort of strategically and you know really clearly indicating what the uh, important screens are going to be, um, in my gorilla task, that information is going to get included in the output. So it's really easy for me to filter after using whatever means you want really to just delete sort of the, the junk lines, the lines that you know aren't going to contain any useful information for your analysis. Um, and then ultimately it just comes down to, in the case of simpler analyses, maybe you only have uh, one stimulus that's being displayed in a given trial. It's very easy then to just filter out um, you know, rows that you don't need that you know aren't going to be important. Um, and in the case of more complex designs, um, you know, I, I've been using pivot tables in Excel and I've found it's, it's been pretty straightforward, but other solutions will work for you. And I think ultimately it comes down to uh, having an idea of what you want your data to look like. And with that, and having that in mind, uh, naming your screens appropriately so that you can easily just extract that data for yourself later and then format uh, your table how you want so you can make it easier when you go to, to do the analysis, whatever software you'd like to use. Uh, in my case, uh, because we use a JavaScript, there is, um, I should check like what James used, but um, it's um, limited like to set up like beforehand. Uh, before we collect the data about the data frame, like how the data looks like. And then it's hard to make it clear. Um, we should uh, update though. But um, right now I'm just um, use um, the R and the pandas, this, uh, the Python uh, to clean up the data. And I don't know, right now, like in my situation, that's the best way to um, the clean up the data like after uh, like after I got the all the information that um, I need like from Gorilla. But um and yeah so otherwise like I also agreed to James that we need to set up uh, beforehand but yeah we should look it up Bella. <laughs> Thank you. All right just um to Lauren I wanted to tell you that Mary put uh, a post in the comments, uh, just to give some um, poor internet services better service, so that might be useful for you. Um, there's a further question from Theodora. Hi, sorry, it's a bit dark here. Um, <laughs> Awesome uh, talks by everyone of you guys. Thank you so much. And the discussion is even more helpful. It covers a lot of uh, the questions. This is a very specific question I have. If any of you have had this, uh, has used a mouse pad uh, during the online testing, because we're using, we want to use Pavlovia, but we want to use also mouse pad and trackpad. So why? when you saw so on laptop when you, yeah and uh we kind of want to differentiate those two motor responses and uh as far as pavlovia goes it's just uh i don't know there everything's being recorded as the same because we're interested in the trajectories of the movement so i was wondering if any of you has used that uh, um, like with gorilla or the uh, other one i can't find the name if you um yeah see, seen different ways in recording the trajectories 
mouse versus trackpad or does it all appear like a mouse or something? I don't think there uh, was a difference because we don't care about like whether they use the mouse pad or not. Uh, I'm not using the time version of the task. So um, yeah, I'm not sure, uh, but you can ask uh, or you can uh, make a pop-up uh, pop questions that like uh, to check participants, whether they use a mouse pad or, or a trackpad. And then after that, like you can do some pilots and compare that maybe that might be helpful, but um, sorry, I cannot answer like the, to the question. No, 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 it was very specific. Yeah. I just didn't know if you use that or not because yeah. you mentioned mouse and I'm like, okay, maybe she's tried this or something. Okay, thanks yeah. so much. So there's a really interesting question from Zara, which uh, I'm really interested in, in hearing the answer. <laughs> Hello everyone. Yeah, thank you so much for the presentations. It was super helpful. I'm actually going to combine both of my questions together because I asked two. Um, my first question was, um, obviously we're all adapting to changes uh, because of COVID. So I'm not sure what the situation is where geographically where you are, but um, I'm in London in the UK and, um, you know, I'm not going to be doing any testing within schools uh, for at least another few months. Uh, but I'm just wondering, once schools are open and we are able to go back to pre-COVID life, if any of you will continue to collect data via Zoom and via online platforms, just because it seems like the information that um, is available is super accessible and a lot easier to collect and I think people are a lot more used to it. So that was my first question. And then my second question was um, if you have any experience or insights um, into working with children that have SEN of any kind and whether that changes the experience of collecting data uh, via these methods. So thank you. Um, Sarah, do you want to speak to that? I can speak to that a little bit. Um, so I think that kind of depends on where you are in the academic trajectory. Uh, so I am a third year doctoral student and by nature of that I am preparing for the next steps of dissertation. And so there's a certain point where you kind of get locked into the studies that you're doing. And so if I have proposed a dissertation that's happening online, I'm not going to give up on that study once it's uh, happening. Uh, but I think in general you're asking more about the efficacy of running uh, experiments online rather than whether or not you're locked into it, right? Um, so I think there's something to say about both types, both in data, in-person data collection versus online. And you can kind of get different data from both and it kind of speaks to two different things. Uh, there's been some interesting conversations on Twitter, which perhaps you are all already engaging in, uh, about what is happening next. So in particular, I care a lot about the school context and how kids learn and how they're learning effectively and what we can do to support them. Uh, and that conversation can't happen without sort of adding in this variable of everything that's happened in the past year, how that affects kids uh, academically, emotionally, and all of these other sort of uh, variables. And, you know, maybe we talk about that as a confounding variable, but maybe we just talk about that as a life factor that has now impacted uh, both the kids that we're interested in testing in both of these capacities and us as researchers as well. So I think it's a complicated question that kind of has all of these, um, you know, interesting ties is that uh, we can't really get away of. So I am definitely going to keep testing online because uh, I have to, to get a PhD. Uh, but I'm also likely to go back to schools because I had already generated uh, pre-shut down a lot of protocols and designs that have kind of just been sitting in the file drawer waiting to be realized in those contexts as well. And the utility of the two different uh, testing contexts uh, do sort of drive different research questions. Um, and then I think you're asking as well uh, in regards to whether or not we had experience uh, working with uh, special education needs. Um, I have not worked with uh, 
any of those populations for quite some time, and I don't have experience running studies uh, in an online format, uh, though I did used to work in a lab that dealt a little bit with children who were deaf or hard of hearing. Um, and I think uh, Marie Coppola is on this call, so maybe just email her directly. She probably has um, more to say on that in particular. I'm sure that there are people within this field that have um, already kind of progressed those studies online as well that would be happy to talk about the differences between the two. Hopefully that helps. Yunji, James? Uh, so, like, it really depends on um, keeping it aligned. Uh, it really depends on the participant's age that you'd like to investigate. Like, in my case, it was fifth and sixth grader. They're um, quite matured. So, uh, it was easy for me to do a line study. And then, like, it seems not the data quality is not so different from uh, the in person study. But, um, so I might keep working on like other data collection if I want to do like, not the several study, but um, if I wanted just to collect like less than 30 minutes, uh, like keep pressing task. Uh, so such as like magnitude comparison task or like cross notation task. And like when it comes to simple paradigm uh, experiments, I think it's good to have a like online setting um, even after the COVID dance uh, because we can get like many data like uh, very quickly. Uh, if you have a really short um, paradigm, then you can just unload to um, Amazon's and uh, yeah, you can do like uh, multi data collections from like other. Uh, different uh, like US sites. But uh, when it comes to like younger children's study, uh, I'm not sure. So um, I think it really depends on the task material and um, and the age of the participants. But um, if it allows, um, I would like to keep going with uh, the data collections when uh, the task is um, like shorts and simple, yeah. And when it comes to special education uh, needs of uh, the children who needs that, um, I don't have um, any experience with that, so uh, I won't be helpful with the question, sorry. <laughs> uh, I definitely see myself uh, using online data collection uh, going forward, at least for certain tasks. So to, to sort of echo Yunji's uh, sentiments, uh, for, for relatively simple tasks, simple paradigms where uh, the task itself takes a relatively short amount of time to complete, I definitely see that as being an area where um, online data collection can excel. Um, simply because those are the types of tasks where the the interaction with participants simply isn't needed. You can uh, embed all of the instructions clearly. You can give them practice trials and and feedback, and it's deliverable in such a way that you, as the researcher, don't need to to be there to ensure that the data you're collecting is of a sufficient quality. But I think that as you work with, uh, I don't know, maybe younger demographics, perhaps younger children, or perhaps you have uh, more complex tasks that might necessitate some interaction with the participant, that's when you'll, that's when you'll probably need to, to actually uh, conduct these studies in person. So I've, online, I think, will definitely have its place, but so too will uh, in person uh, in lab studies, at least as far as my research is concerned. And uh, as to your second question, uh, I unfortunately don't have uh, any experience working with special education needs children either. So I, uh, I'm sorry, I can't really speak to, uh, speak to that. So thank you. Um, there's some great discussions happening uh, in chat as well. I don't think there's more specific questions. So if we want to open up for some more discussions, I know there's... Um, Mary talking a lot about home learning environment, uh, which I also thought about when Zara asked the question, um, if you want to do the online testing, it's going to be in a home learning environment. It's going to be with a parent or with somebody caring for it, which might be very different to a 
and staying in schools. So that might be something to keep in mind. Uh, and as Harry was saying, that there is very little uh, studies out there about the home uh, environment um, in children with disabilities. So that's something to think about. And then there's also um, Andy saying, talking a bit more about how to do it semi-structured um, through Zoom, like a hybrid model of testing, which I, I like the idea of a hybrid model of testing. Yeah, so our lab in the past has done um, some hybrid approaches where we do regular in-lab visits for slightly longer um, batteries of data collection, but then we do uh, like 10 minute Zoom calls that are recorded to get kind of regular, this is what interaction looks like in the home, or I'm developing a project right now where we're going to have kids play um, a game of war or something with a, a simple deck of cards that most families have and would be easy to get to families and, and inexpensive to get to families if they don't have that particular resource. Um, I also wanted to take a second to invite Marie to, to speak a little bit about what she'd said, because I know some people aren't monitoring the chat as much. Um, so Marie, if you wanted to, to say hi as well. Hi, everybody. I totally was not prepared to be on camera with uh, <laughs> a bunch of I just miss seeing you. <laughs> nice to see everybody. And I, I can't say how much I appreciate how um, everybody sharing their experiences. It just... I love this community. It's very collaborative and uh, supportive. And so um, I will just repeat what I, I said in the chat. Um, I was kind of shocked actually to learn how little uh, research has been done. I, I mean, A, on the actual math and numeracy skills of children with disabilities themselves, but there's actually almost nothing. There's one study in Australia from several years ago that was some kind of government report that was the only thing that I was able to find on children with disabilities. And um, that's like terrible. Um, and even in my own work, uh, I, my project is currently focusing on developmental trajectory of number concept development in deaf and hard of hearing children, whether they sign or are using spoken language. And, um, you know, the number one question I get asked when I go to schools is, what about the kids who have additional disabilities? And there's like, there's zero, there's zero, even though that's a pretty substantial portion of kids. Uh, so I think that's an area that really, really is calling out for attention. And um, yeah, I, obviously there's going to be additional things that you need to consider. And that's what we're grappling with now, like trying to do these studies online. The, the big plus, yes, there will be challenges and it's going to depend on the nature of the child's disability, right? Um, but the advantage is, uh, you know, deafness is very low frequency. So two to three out of a, a thousand kids. So uh, what we've been doing up to now is flying around the country, collecting data and obviously not sustainable in a pandemic, but not really sustainable um, So in, in a longer term. So um, I do think that uh, people are studying smaller populations really do need to figure out how to do the online testing well. And I really, I would love to know more about your combination, Andy, of, I really like the, that approach of this hybrid that gives you different perspectives on what kids know. So I, I look forward to continuing these conversations. And I'm happy to answer, if people think some of my experience would be helpful to them, shoot me an email and I'll do my best. Great, thank you. Um, I do like the hybrid thing because you get such an insight of the home learning environment, which you normally wouldn't get. Plus, you don't even have to be there, so you're just a screen, so you're not actually influencing the, the learning environment that much. 